Hey guys, Kevin Ploey here from Yahoo Entertainment. It has been a treat to be here this week guest hosting Build Series. Thank you to everyone here for having me. And speaking of treats, through its thrilling first season on Netflix, Mindhunter has established itself as one of the best true crime shows we've seen hit television in decades. The show follows a pair of FBI agents in the late 1970s who pioneer the practice of interviewing incarcerated serial killers in hopes of helping catch others. Our next guest plays one of those men, the hard-boiled, beer-loving detective Bill Tench, and brings an undeniable authenticity to the part and to the series itself. Holt McAllany will join us in just a moment, but first, here's a look at Mindhunter, season two premiering on Netflix, August 16th. We think it came in here, two kids making their lunches, over three had already gone to school. They had five kids in this house. Retired military, used to base housing. No forced entry. The dog was in the yard when we got here. It makes no sense to come into a house with an adult male and a dog. Nothing makes sense. He took the money out of Mr. Otero's wallet, emptied her purse, and stole Mr. Otero's aviator's watch. But clearly, robbery was not his motive. And the driver's licenses were missing. Yeah. He was taking souvenirs. And he already knew what he wanted on his very first kill. Guys, give it up. Holt McGowany is here. How you doing today, Holt? Great, thanks for having me. You are from New York. Is this a homecoming or do you live here? I was born in New York City yes. in Mount Sinai Hospital okay. on the Upper East Side. And uh, yeah, I live, in, I live in Midtown. Awesome, awesome. So not, not, you didn't have to travel very far for this interview. Uh, let's get into Mindhunter. Uh, congrats, you are killer on this show. You are not a killer. There, there, there are many killers on the show. You are not one of them. But you are killer. You deliver killer performances. Uh, Thank you. Every episode. Uh, this is has become one of the the most acclaimed shows on television. I think you'd say. I don't think anyone expected anything less uh, from the mind of David Fincher, who of course uh, is an executive producer and, and director on it. Um, but let's get into to, into season two. Tell 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 us what uh, what these guys are up to. Our our, our ace detectives in season two. Yeah, well, uh, for those of you who remember season one, um, at the end, uh, our unit is being investigated by the Office of Professional Responsibility, the OPR, mm -hmm. and um, uh, then my partner, Holden Ford, uh, played by a superb young actor named Jonathan Groff, mm -hmm. who, uh, since we're in New York, is a big Broadway star. He was in Hamilton. Hamilton, yes. He was nominated for a Tony Award. He did uh, Spring Awakening, a really, really... Uh, gifted uh, young guy, and he takes off, and um, he goes uh, uh, to see one of our serial killers, uh, Ed Kemper, who was uh, really brilliantly portrayed last season by a young actor named Cameron Britton, who was nominated for an Emmy Award for his performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he is. He's taken off. Mm -hmm. And um, so season two picks up just a few days after the end of season one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a we have a new unit chief, and um, you know I have to find Holden. I have to bring him back and bring him back to work. Mm -hmm. And um, you know uh, there's a lot of internal conflict mm -hmm. in in our unit at the beginning of season yeah. two. Yeah, I think you can say Holden has definitely gotten himself into some deep doo doo, uh, both professionally and personally. It, it, it turns out what, what we see him go through at the end of season one. Um, but I love these two together. Uh, they're, they're such a great odd couple. How would you say that, you know, as I don't want to say too much about season two, it, it premieres tomorrow. Um, but I think we can say something uh, about the fact that Tench has to sort of reel him in. Uh, how would you say that the dynamic between these two characters is, is going to evolve in, in season two? Yeah, well, you know, look, I mean, I think that part of what uh, people respond to about Jonathan and me as these characters is that we're really different. We're almost like a study in contrast. Yeah. And in real life, too, I mean, we're great friends and we get along famously, uh, but uh, he's a brilliant guy, but his behavior is sometimes erratic. Mm -hmm. He can be very impetuous. He can be overconfident. You know, he's new to the FBI. I've been in the mm -hmm. FBI for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I understand the bureaucracy a lot better than him. Um, so uh, I, I'm trying to kind of do two things simultaneously. Keep an eye on him and stop him from getting himself into trouble, mm -hmm. but still encourage him to do, you know, the kind of work that he's so good at. Mm -hmm. 
And as you mentioned, you guys have a new boss. Uh, who's introduced a really terrific actor named Michael Cerverus, who, uh, uh, another Broadway actor, a multiple Tony winner, and uh, just terrific in the part, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, and he comes right in uh, episode one of season two. Uh, right, he does, with my, a completely different attitude than his predecessor. Sure, yeah, you know? my, my early take, I've only seen episode one from season two, my early take is too good to be true, but I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say about that. Well, look, you know, um, you got to remember that when we meet these guys, we're in the late 70s, and it's only a few years after Hoover mm -hmm. uh, ran the FBI, when mm -hmm. it was a very conservative organization. And so we're talking really about the birth of criminal profiling. So it's, it's kind of a radical new concept in, in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what would really be the value, you might ask, of interviewing these murderers? They're already convicted. Right. You know, the FBI was in the business of arresting, you know, uh, perpetrators, you know, mm -hmm. not interviewing them to find out why they committed their crimes. So, so initially, we, re we encounter a lot of resistance with this new idea. Mm -hmm. um, but then Michael Cerverus comes uh, into our unit uh, with a completely different attitude. Mm -hmm. And he says, I see the value of this work. I'm gonna give you guys the resources that you need, the staff that you need, but I expect you to get results. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we, you, you mentioned Kemper in, in the in the season one. Um, there's a couple other serial killers that you guys either um, interact with or, or sort of play into the into the, the plots at various points. The BTK killer. Um, who can we expect to see in season two? You know, I mean, look, I can't reveal everything. Yeah. But um, we have uh, an amazing performance. Um, from an actor named Damon Harriman, who plays Charles Manson. Yes, Holden and finally gets Holden to gets Manson. To, he's to been he's been wanting Manson. Manson, and you know, um, uh, and David made a really uh, uh, wise decision, and uh, he hired the prosthetic makeup team that had done Gary Oldman as uh, uh, as Is Churchill, as uh, right, yeah. and so. Um, um, he, you know, these guys, they do a six hour prosthetic makeup before they show up on the set. So for example, the actor who plays Charles Manson, the actor who plays David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, yeah. when they come through the door, they look exactly. There's a photo of, of the actor as Manson uh, online. And it is creepy how, how much he resembles him. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, like he looks exactly like him, but then, you know, you also have to deliver. Yeah. And, um, uh, it's just riveting, you know. Uh, I, I give full props to uh, our casting department, Lorraine Mayfield in L.A., because she has found guys to play these serial killers that are they, they just give such powerful perform performances, mm, yeah. and they're hard parts to play. Yeah, and I and I gotta imagine as an actor that's gonna help sort of authenticate the experience for you when you walk into a room. And this guy is literally a spitting image of Charles Manson. Well, absolutely. You know, and I think that's part of the reason for the success of the show is because, you know, we really tried to make everything as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. We do the real cases. These are the real stories of the real crimes. Mm -hmm. And we try to be as accurate as we can about the personal histories of the criminals, you know, the way they committed the crimes. We try to understand why they committed the crimes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people recognize that authenticity and that's what they respond to. Yeah. What would you say that you've learned like throughout y your experience on this show about, you know, I know this is a little bit general, but about the, the psychology of serial killers? Look, you know, I mean, it, it's an endlessly fascinating subject because although they're all very different, they have things in common. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're trying to explore on Mindhunter um, is sexual homicide, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the psychological underpinnings of sexually motivated crimes. And, you know, why do these men, you know, um, uh, what motivates them, uh, you know, to kidnap and torture and mutilate in certain cases, mm -hmm. you know, complete strangers? Um, and so um, it's really, it, it, it's really, it's dark and, and it's disturbing, but at the same time, you know, the more you kind of peel the onion, the more that you kind of realize that um, it, has a, it has a lot to do, uh, you know, with, with their childhoods, mm -hmm. you know, with their relationships, with their mothers. Specifically with the, their mothers, usually, right? It, it is, their fathers, you know. It's always and, their mothers. Well, you know, I mean, it, 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 the, sometimes, you know, the father um, uh, uh, plays, plays a role, but in many cases, you're right, it's an absent yeah. or alcoholic father. Mm -hmm. It's an abusive or domineering 
mother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, uh, uh, they grow up with this sort of animosity toward women. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and they have these, you know, really depraved fantasies that eventually they begin to act on. Mm-hmm. And so what is the thing that triggers that, that causes them from going to thinking about these crimes to actually committing these crimes? Right. It's right. different in each case, but it's, uh, it's, it's a wild subject. Were, were many of them actually bedwetters, or is that just a myth? That's something you, know, you always no, hear. No, I mean, that, 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 th- those were the three things, right? It was, uh, it was um, torturing animals, mm-hmm. yeah. st- starting fires, yeah. right, and, uh, and wetting the bed yeah. were, the, were the three things. But, you, yeah, you, you do see that um, in some cases. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, you do, and some of them um, uh, were the victims of sexual abuse themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and many cases they came from um, underprivileged, uh, you know, uh, and socioeconomically deprived backgrounds, but not in every case. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's endlessly fascinating, because mm-hmm. there's so much variation between them. Sure, sure. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit more about Jonathan Groff. You guys, as I mentioned, are, are, are so, so great together. Uh, an odd couple that you really learn to love uh, just watching play, play off one another every every episode. Um, but tell us just sort of, you know, your impression of him as a, as a co-star in, on a day-to-day you basis. Know, I mean, I mean, you know, this, this young actor is going to be a really big star. I mean, he's not only a super talented guy and he can do anything you know i mean right now you know he's uh uh written rehearsals uh for an off-broadway play that's going to open mm-hmm. a musical that's going to open um in january um he's already been nominated for two tony awards you know um he had he's had huge success with our show um you know he's a great singer he's a great actor mm-hmm. he can he can do anything but also like um he's just one of like the nicest kindest guys that I've ever met, always in a good mood, with a big smile on his face. He lights up a room. I get really lucky, because Mm -hmm. the truth is that when you make a television show, you end up spending thousands of hours with the guys (laughs) that you work with. You get to know people so well when you do a series with them. And if you get stuck with somebody that you don't really like, it can make your life miserable (laughs) because you're with them 15 hours a day, every single day. So the greatest gift that you can have um, is a a talented co-star that you really enjoy being around. Fun fact about Jonathan, also the voice of Kristoff in, Frozen. in a little Disney phenomenon called yep. Frozen. Yes. Have you seen his work, heard his yeah, work I, on you Frozen? Know, I, you know, I, I'm not a Frozen fan. <laughs> I, I, I will be honest, but I am I a Jonathan Groff fan. I would have pinned you for a Frozen fan. <laughs> I mean, I, I have two daughters, so I have seen Frozen. Uh, I've seen his work roughly 50,000 times uh, in, in that film, but he's great. Uh, this is obviously such heavy material. Um, do you guys manage, you know, in your days spending 15 hours together, do you manage to sort of tr- try to keep it light uh, on set? Yeah, you know, look, um, w- w- you know, w- levity is important. Um, and it's important uh, as actors, and it's also important uh, as the characters sometimes to find the humor in the fact that Jonathan and I are so different, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, but sure, when we're on set, you know, and David Fincher has a very dark sense of humor too, and is a very funny guy. Yeah. You know, so uh, so we, you know we do we crack jokes and and uh, and we have fun, but you know we also work in a in a really you know concentrated way. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think? I mean. I'm sure you've encountered this with fans of the show, um, but I, I feel like there is a deep, deep obsession in our country with serial killers. Do you think we have an unhealthy obsession with serial killers? You know, man, I mean, I think we're just fascinated by these guys because we just can't understand how it's possible how and that they can commit such horrible crimes. Yeah. You know, when you, when you really study what some of these guys do, to people, it's just it's uh, it's mind-boggling mm-hmm. that that one human being could do that to another human being mm-hmm. and then derive sexual pleasure from it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, um, uh, torturing somebody. Do you know? You know, mm-hmm. mutilating somebody. It's mm-hmm. so so. It's like um, I think that's what fascinates us about us. It's it's like it's like they're they're aliens from another planet. Mm. Does your work ever follow you home? I mean, we I think I think we all have work anxiety dreams. Did did, did you start getting having darker, more sordid 
dreams or nightmares w once you well, start look, getting, you know, getting into the, into the subject? It's a great material? question. I mean, you know, because you do spend a lot of time reading about these killers and the crimes that they committed. Um, because, you know, we cover a lot of different ones, you know, and the next episode is coming up. It's a new killer. It's a whole different situation. It's a whole different, you know, uh, set of crimes that you have to uh, familiarize yourself with. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm an actor, and I know that we're creating a drama mm -hmm. that is uh, about these guys. The people it's different for, in my view, are the detectives that really have to try to catch these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because they obsess about these crimes in a different way. They're trying to find this guy before he can kill again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, they perform an important uh, function in society as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So when they obsess about these crimes, pouring over the crime scene photos, talking to the families of the victims, trying to put themselves in the minds of the murderers, um, uh, they sometimes pay a real price for it, mm -hmm. psychologically and emotionally, even physically. Have you spent a lot of time with actual FBI agents in this I division? Have, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, for John Douglas, who wrote the book Mind Hunter, mm -hmm. um, uh, became a friend of mine and uh, was somebody that I had a lot of contact with, and you know, went and spent time with him at his house in Virginia, and and uh, uh, a fascinating guy, mm -hmm. very very knowledgeable, very experienced. Um, there's another gentleman named Greg McCrary who wrote a wonderful book called The Unknown Darkness, who was also uh, an FBI agent in the behavioral science unit um, at Quantico. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we went to Quantico, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we met all those guys, mm -hmm. interviewed all those guys, and they, they remain a resource uh, to you. So if you have a question, you read a script, you, you, you don't understand something, you can call John or call Greg and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? You know, yeah. we do the Atlanta child murders, right? Right, in right, season right. Two. You know, well, Douglas was down there. You know, he was one of the agents who investigated that. So he has a lot of firsthand knowledge. He can send you the case file. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He can, you know, so uh, um, what I found is that the guys in law enforcement um, are very generous, you know, with sharing their their experiences and their wisdom, mm -hmm. and they always try to make themselves available mm -hmm. to, to actors to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's uh, I appreciate that. There's certainly a, a hard to watch aspect to this show. I mean, as as if there is with any series about you know, like whether it's like kidnapping or serial killers, season two hits on both of those in a, in a way, because it, as you mentioned, it does in, involve the, the series of, of killings, ch child killings in Atlanta. Um, what, can you, when you, what can you say about that in terms of, you know, how that sort of changes the stakes for these guys in season two? Yeah, well, it, it, it really does, because, you know, this is the first time that you'll see um, uh, Agent Ford and Agent Tench actually participating in a real-time, ongoing investigation. And, you know, the thing about the Atlanta child murders, um, you know, which for those of you that, aren't, that don't remember, because it was many, many years ago, was um, um, uh, this uh, long series of uh, young African-American boys who were being abducted and murdered and like dumped in the woods. And it was very tragic and very, very grim. And, uh, and it was, it kind of, it was a national story. Um, some of you who are old enough might remember an advertising campaign that said, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, kids were just disappearing mm -hmm. and nobody knew what was going on. And, you know, it's not, it's very different, for example, from like the Manson family murders, the Tate LaBianca murders. Yeah. Because, you know, if you remember, like, you know, um, you know, Charles Manson was this kind of like ex-con hippie guru who wanted to be a rock star. He used to hang out with Dennis Wilson from mm -hmm. the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. They murdered Sharon Tate, who was mm -hmm. a movie star. Do, yeah. do, do, do you know what I mean? Who was married yeah. to a famous director, yeah. the Roman Polanski. It was in Beverly Hills. You know, even though they were those those killings were really depraved and it's hard to imagine anybody dying a more horrible death mm -hmm. than Sharon Tate you know being stabbed to death when she was pregnant mm -hmm. at the same time in the public consciousness there remains something kind of glamorous in a way about the Manson family murders with the Atlanta child murders there's nothing glamorous right. it was just these nameless faceless poor, young African-American kids that were being abducted and killed. Yeah. So um, it's a very different kind of a, a story to tell. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we got to talk some David Fincher. Uh, this and this is a reunion for you guys. You, of course, were were in Fight Club, uh, contemporary was, yeah. classic film. Uh, but yeah, tell us about you know uh, he's an EP. He does some directing on this, but just you know his sort of mindset entering this, what experiences you, you've had together on on the show, what it's like been you know working with him again. Yeah, well, look, you know, I mean, David is really the reason for the success of the show. I mean, it was. Uh, um, you know, it's it's it, it's really all David. Uh, he's uh, he's really one of the most brilliant filmmakers of his generation. He's an incredibly um, gifted, intelligent, hardworking, meticulous guy who's really driven to make things as good as they can possibly be. Mm -hmm. You know, much is made of the fact that we do a lot of takes. Right. But many, many more than you would ever. I do think I read he them. averages like fifty takes or uh, a I mean, shot look, or something like that. Sometimes you know, we, we you know certain scenes. I think we've done as many as sixty or sixty-five. You know, okay. but we do a lot of setups yeah. and then a lot of takes within each setup. But I think the reason for it is because. You know, he just is very passionate about making something as good as it can possibly be. He doesn't want to get into the editing room and find that he's missing something that he really needs. Mm -hmm. And he also understands that actors, as they inhabit a scene, are going to discover things along the way. So you're going to learn something in scene 30. Mm -hmm. You're going to find something that you didn't know in scene in take three. Do, right. do, do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so we do it. We do it over and over again, and it requires a lot of concentration. But when you're really meticulous like that and very mm -hmm. precise, then you can make a, a product, you know, like yeah. Mindhunter. Yeah. And he, he has explored um, this landscape before. Zodiac, Seven, Seven al right. also had serial killers. Right. Is, is he, like, from your talking, your talking with him, obviously he's heavily fascinated by the, this subject material. What do you think keeps bringing him back into, into this world? Look, you know, he has, like, an encyclopedic uh, knowledge of it. You know, I think that... Um, you know, I, I think he is intrigued, you know, mm -hmm. by, by these by these dark stories and, and these dark characters. And, uh, you know, there is something kind of like um, inherently unsettling and dramatic about, you know, these these depraved uh, criminals. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, I'm really lucky because although although seven, I think, is a masterpiece film. It's just an extraordinary film. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it stars Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt. It was mm -hmm. David's second movie, and it's it's a, literally a masterpiece. And Zodiac, I think, um, is the film that, that David believes is his best film. Yeah. Although I believe he, he said that to me one time. But, you know, we're getting to make a television show. Mm -hmm. And that is an ongoing story. You know, and one of the great things about TV is that you get, when it's good, is you get to explore a character in much greater detail mm -hmm. than you ever would in a movie because there just isn't enough time in a two-hour movie. You know, season one of, of Mindhunter was 10 episodes long, and season two is nine episodes long. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, there's a lot more real estate to really, you know, explore these guys and this yeah. world. Yeah. And when you get to take that kind of a journey with a director like David Fincher, it doesn't bless you. It doesn't really get any better than that, you know, yeah. uh, in TV. Yeah. Well, let's go. Let's go back in time a bit. It's crazy to think Fight Club turns twenty this year. Right. Uh, tell us some of your fondest memories from that experience. You know, uh, every once in a while, when you're an actor, you are shooting something that you just kind of know, even while you're filming it. But filming it, mm -hmm. I'm a part of something really special, and we believed that about Fight Club. It was, it was, it was the story, it was, it was the cast, it was David's vision of it, uh, it was the, the, the moment in time, culturally, that we were telling that story. We just knew that, that this was a really special film. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when it came out, originally, mm -hmm. it wasn't really embraced did yeah, you, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. we were all kind of like stunned uh, in in a way that that people you know didn't appreciate it the way the way that we did, but over the years, yeah. um, it has really become an iconic film. 
Sure. And for me personally, you know, it was a really um, important project because even though I had had a long career as an actor, um, Fight Club was the the project that people remembered me from mm-hmm. most. Yeah. And and it was sort of like the best thing, even though I had a small part. You know, yeah. um, it was something that I was most proud of. But such a memorable scene that I wanted to ask you about. And I know, I know you know what I'm about to say. Ro- In death, a member of Project Mayhem has a name. <laughs> His name is it's Robert, Robert Paulson. Paulson. His name is Robert Purple. Paulson. His name is Robert Purple. Paulson. Yeah. Well, what do you remember about filming that? You know, uh, uh, actually, what I remember about that day was that. Um, there was a little bit of controversy, you know, ab- about the way, you know, David spends a lot of time setting up shots mm-hmm. and, you know, um, is, you know, there's a huge amount of preparation. And um, what I recall is that um, there was a little bit of, 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 of a disagreement initially um, uh, between Edward Norton and David about uh, uh, how he was going to enter the room or something. Um, but um, once we got that resolved, um, then we started we started filming it, you know, and all the guys are there, you know, and we bring in Meatloaf, you know, mm-hmm. who is a is a is a wonderful guy and a mm-hmm. terrific actor, and there was this kind of this electric, you know, energy in the room, and uh, and and we're and and we're chanting his name, and it, that was like one Robert of those Paulson. moments. I was yeah. like, I knew like this is yeah. going to be one of the best scenes in the movie. Yes, yes. And that's Meatloaf, the singer-actor. Meatloaf, the singer-actor, not, bad out of Not the hell. delicacy. Right. Rocky yes. Horror <laughs> Show. You know, for those of you, they, these you're pretty young. Yeah. We might not have many Meatloaf fans, <laughs> but if you don't know who he is, uh, get an album called Bad Out of Hell. Yes. Right. All right, we're going to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience. Hi there. Hi. Um, so you mentioned doing a lot of research and reading up on cases and seeing a common thread throughout serial killers. Do you ever unconsciously uh, profile people you interact with on a daily basis and see if they check any of the boxes for serial killer? (laughs) You know, you know what you, what you find, um, you know, when you, when you play a detective is that you become more of a student of human behavior. You know, detectives are always kind of like, um, um, you know, analyzing people and the things that they say, and do I believe you? Do, 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 you know what I mean? So, so yeah, uh, and, then, and then, you know, we also live in a world where, um, sadly, there's still a lot of murder that happens, right? We saw mass shootings recently in El Paso, in Dayton, you know, um, uh, and, and, you know, you find yourself um, immediately asking yourself, you know, I wonder what motivated that particular crime. I wonder what triggered that uh, uh, killer to, to choose that particular day to act out a fantasy that he may have had for a very long time. So the answer is yes, it does start to change the way you think about things, absolutely. And it does for the characters as well. That's a plot point that's explored in season one with that with that, that poor principal, right? <laughs> they, they start sort of overanalyzing this guy and you know, much to his detriment. Uh, and and that's why you know I, I think it's important like you know to look at each of these guys individually um, because they're all very very different and you can't paint them all with the same brush and say this is why these kinds of guys commit these kinds of crimes because um, it can be it can be completely different motivations once you start to really look underneath it. We've got one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, there's so many like iconic criminals and things that you do research on and look into, but there's also a great amount of like very um, influential detectives and FBI agents and police officer characters throughout like film and TV history. Is there any characters in particular that you look to to inform your performance? Wow, that is such a good question. Well, you know, I mean, the guy that I play, Bill Tench, is kind of loosely inspired by uh, a famous FBI agent named Robert Ressler. And uh, Robert Ressler um, wrote uh, a really interesting uh, book called Whoever Fights Monsters. And I would say that, you know, when I first got the part, that was the first thing that I, that I read, and um, 
I, uh, I really drew a lot, you know, from, from Robert. And look, he died in 2013. So we started filming the show, you know, you know what I mean, I, in 2016. So if I have one regret, <laughs> I would have loved to have been able to, to meet Robert Ressler and uh, uh, to talk to him. Obviously, his partner was John Douglas who wrote Mindhunter. So, you know, I did get to, you know, spend time with John and I, I'm still in contact with John very frequently. Um, but I read, uh, he wrote five books, Robert, and I read all of his books and uh, I would say that um, he had a big influence on, on the choices that I made. And is that where you got the haircut from? The, the, old uh, the haircut was cut? David's idea. Oh, okay. I, can't, I can't take uh, <laughs> responsibility for that. And yeah. the funny thing about the haircut was, you know, when they first told, when he first said, I, well, what about a flat top? I want you to wear a flat top. I thought, oh, great. This will be so low maintenance, right? <laughs> It'll be no time in the mm. chair in the morning, a little bit of gel, and we'll go. What I did not understand is that having a flat top is one of the most high maintenance haircuts yeah. that you could ever have. Every time it grows a little yeah. bit, you've got to trim it. It's got to be the same shape every scene. It's uh, uh, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it adds something to the character. It does. It does. It, right? It tells you who this guy is. It tells you who you, this guy the is. The moment you see him. Right. Yeah. Holt, thank you so much for being here. What a pleasure. Here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you much. Support, I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, guys. Check out Mindhunter, season two, August 16th on Netflix. Mm -hmm.